Hi, everybody. Uh, happy holidays here. Um, just uh, recording one last class, uh, sort of full class, just here right after Christmas. Um, for New Year's, just to tie up our Heart Sutra class uh, for the year and just sort of auspicious uh, closing our discussion of emptiness, projecting it into the new year with our work and our study so we can keep sort of uh, growing and progressing on the path. So this is our first uh, Christmas here, Christina and I, at our new home. We're really, really happy, and it's been great. It's like a little hermitage here in Nelson. So hopefully we can sort of share that energy uh, with you today uh, on class. The recording here. So, um, yeah, so do this, and then I'll t talk kind of sort of a brief uh, next class uh, before I review just on the mantra, the Project Parmita mantra. But we'll just sort of finish up here with some remarks on um, the, the five paths uh, to enlightenment, sort of final two paths, the path of habituation or embodiment, so to speak, sort of what's also called path of Gomer meditation and the path of no more learning and how this ties into the Heart Sutra. Okay, and starting with the Heart Sutra here. Homage to Professor Wisdom of the Blessed Mother. Thus I have heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgir and Mass Walters Mountain, great assembly amongst the nuns and great assembly of Bodhisattvas. That time the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time also Superior Vadashara, the body's half of the great being, was looking perfectly at the price of profound perfection of wisdom, looking perfectly also at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence. Then through the power of Buddha, Venerable Shara put to a sentence Superior Vadashara, the body's half of the great being, how should a son of the lineage train who wished to engage with the price of profound perfection of wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Superior Vadashara, the body's half of the great being, replied to Venerable Sharaputra as follows. Shari put to whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage with the price of profound perfection of wisdom should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly, also the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence, form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shri Pucha, this all phenomena are emptiness, having no characteristics, they are produced and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement, they have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Sherry Puncher, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tactile object, no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so forth, up to no mentality element, also up to no element of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance, uh, and no ignorance, and no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, and no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there's no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, Shari Pucha, because there's no attainment, body is rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Passing and it'll be on perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, became a manifest complete Buddhas in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the equal, the unequal mantra, the mantra that thoroughly passed well as all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. The mantra of perfection wisdom is proclaimed, Tayata, um, gada gada para gada para sam gada gada soha. Shari Putra, body suffer, great being should train the profound perfection wisdom like this. Then the blessed one arose in that concentration and said, for about sure the body suffer, the great being that he spoken well. Good, good, some of just like that, since it's like that, just as you have revealed, and now we the profound perfection wisdom should be practiced, and the Tata Gadis will also rejoice. When the Blessed One said this, the noble Shariputra, Spirit of Alakshara, the Bodhisattva, the Great Being, the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, demigods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised by them and spoken by the Blessed One. So take a moment here to meditate, visualizing ourselves in a wide open space, crowned like Lapis Azuli, and just feel that all sentient beings of all six realms of cyclic existence are here with us meditating today. <coughs> kind of like the holiday season, good energy. I'm going to share this around the world, just this open-heartedness to all the uh, places where there's war and conflict and real negative and suffering emotions and experiences. So our mother on our left, father on our right, people we love the most behind us as support, and people we have issues with in front of us as objects of compassion. Moving up from there, people from all over the world, all different places, backgrounds, All the different sort of natural beings here, natural environment, the animal realm, hummingbirds, bees, insects, fish, and so forth, mammals. 
all the beings from the spirit realm, just as uh, varied and just as numerous. Celestial beings from the god and demigod realms. And countless beings in lower states of rebirth. You can think of different uh, hungry ghost beings and hell beings and so forth. And we're all here as a family, uh, sort of sentient being family meditating, doing dharma together. Beautiful dome of a blue sky above us and in front of us and above us, we can visualize two um, embodiments or symbols of wisdom. The Prajaparamita goddess here, Prajaparamita, the mother of all the Buddhas. And below her, Shakyamuni Buddha, fourth universal Buddha of this aeon, uh, I should say this era. Um, and uh, the fourth Buddha, this is sort of the source of our Buddhist teachings and sort of our teacher. All of our teachers in this life are manifestations of Buddha Shakyamuni. So we can feel Buddha Shakyamuni is just in the usual form in lotus position with three rows of a monk holding a begging bowl of medicinal nectar in his left hand and right hand touching the earth with a subduing mudra. And above him, gold, uh, with a golden light or energy, just like him, is Prajaparamita, and she's a beautiful young woman uh, seated in lo lotus posture. Wearing a crown and earrings and jewelry, silks and so forth. And her first uh, two inches, forearms, uh, first two hands are the meditative equipoise at her lap. And uh, the other left hand is holding Prajaparamita text, um, a perfection wisdom text, a sutra, 100,000 lines. And right hand is holding a dorje, or if you like a double dorje, you can make them gold or crystal, depending on what you like. Take refuge here. I and all sentient beings to each enlightenment go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I and all sentient beings to each enlightenment go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I and all sentient beings to each enlightenment go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Generating awakening might of great compassion to become enlightened for the benefit of all and help lead them to enlightenment. Through the virtues we collect by giving and other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Generating love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free from misery. May no one ever be separate from their happiness. And may everyone have equanimity, free from hatred. Seven limb practice, prostration, offering, confession, rejoicing, asking all holy beings to stay and to teach and dedication here. So prostration, we prostrate body, speech, and mind to the two um, holy beings, the two light beings here, the synthesis of all other holy beings. So Prajnaparamita and Buddha. each and every offering to them. Just from our heart, we can visualize countless beautiful offerings. Example, uh, just countless uh, flower offerings, garlands, and so forth, gardens. Confessing all of our wrong deeds and negativities from beginning this time. Sort of stand up, owning and acknowledging them, and sort of, or the Buddhists here and sentient beings, say that we're going to work on them and purify them and let them go. And rejoicing in our own virtue and the virtue of others and the goodness of all holy beings and all this good energy in the world with opening heart and just uh, sort of soaking it in and rejoicing and being happy about it and just sort of exponentially multiplying it all in our hearts and minds. Asking all holy beings, like beings, to stay and to teach us and guide us. of our lives and future lives. So again, we can just even from our heart, just sending up a white lion throne and a golden eight spoke uh, wheel, Dharma wheel, just you know, the symbols, please stay with us and please continue to teach and guide us, teach us the Dharma in particular, teaching us wisdom, realizing emptiness. And dedicating all this merit, all good energy and virtue here to the awakening of all beings.
last often holding a purified uh, pure universe mandala here in front at our hearts and offer this up to all holy beings the ground sprinkled with perfume and spread with flowers the great mountain four lands sun and moon seen as a buddha land and offer thus may all beings enjoy such pure lands send forth this jewel mandala to you precious gurus and holy beings oh madam guru radna mandala kamoti ami Having said all that, just gold and lights and nectar is coming down from the hearts of all holy beings. Just giving us all good energy, just like lighting from one candle to another and a lamp, increasing all the light and wisdom, goodness and positive spiritual power here. So all sentient beings, just like sunlight coming down from Prajnaparamita's heart and Buddha's heart into us. We're all kind of glowing here. Ask uh, for the absorption meditation here, asking for blessings from Prajnaparamita and Buddha. To hear Buddha Shakyamuni, Prajnaparamita, whose minds are the synthesis of all Buddha jewels, speech is synthesis of all Dharma jewels, and body synthesis of all uh, Sangha jewels. So their mind, speech, and body become the three jewels of uh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha here. Just think they're all of our gurus, all of the Buddhas, all of the Bodhisattvas, Yidams and Protectors, and all sort of synthesize or condense in these two figures. We ask you, please grant us your blessings of body, speech, and mind. So with this we can feel Prajnaparamita melts into light and becomes like a golden ball of light, like a sun. It sort of goes melts into Buddha Shakyamuni and he becomes like a ball of light. Again, they're equal in their realization. They're both expressions of wisdom realizing emptiness. So two suns become one here. And it gets really, really small, like a little, uh, about the size of a sunflower seed. Or if you can go smaller, you can get a sesame seed here, like a little gold nugget. Or a little shooting star it comes down to the crown of our head. Enters our crown chakra. And just in front of our spine, slowly descends like a little star the sun into our heart and once it reaches our heart just feel that it uh, mixes inseparably with us dissolves into our root mind kind of like our soul or center of our being and all the wisdom compassion power and realizations of the path to the realization of emptiness become just like an injection or an iv directly into our heart and become one with us you feel great, great sort of awakening, spaciousness, openness, luminosity or awakeness. And again, these wonderful qualities or virtues of great love and compassion, open-heartedness here, wisdom and spiritual power.
me out of meditation here. Let's look at our class here. So, okay. So just sort of finishing up just the final uh, teachings just on the Heart Sutra here, just for our uh, very modest, very small introductory uh, course on the Heart Sutra. Um, we can talk about um, this point five uh, gateways uh, to uh, freedom. So sort of four doorways, you could say, to, to freedom here. So first one is the uh, door of emptiness in a uh, sort of very, very obvious way, which is every existing thing is emptiness. That's you sort of get that in the um, uh, sort of the big list of things in the Heart Sutra, you know, where there's, you know, no this, no that, you know, going through all of the um, skandhas and so forth and objects of mind, everything, everything is emptiness. So uh, in the context of the Heart Sutra, this refers to the emptiness of a given object. So uh, any object of the mind is empty. So the classic case like the, the kettle or the pot, the fact that the pot isn't there from its own side. So what you usually get in some of the Tibetan texts, uh, I, I actually don't know the, um, the Tibetan expression for it, unfortunately, but the idea that exists from its own side. So it's almost like, you know, if your your mind and the object, it's like they're divided by a river or something. It's like the pot's on the other side of the river. It has nothing to do with you. So this is the idea that something uh, kind of like an object uh, to be negated when you're meditating on emptiness. It's the idea that the object uh, of your mind stands outside of any re relationship to anything else, any other object. Um, you know, parts of itself or whatever. But most of all, it stands out. You know, so they always go like, for instance, it would, wouldn't be in a causal network. It wouldn't have anything to do with causes and effects. Uh, it wouldn't be in the next sort of more subtle level of understanding a question of whole of parts or the set of relationships to anything else. You know, it's not a part of anything. It's not related to anything else. And at the most sort of subtle level, it wouldn't even be related to your mind. It wouldn't have any um, the relationship to um, it, its existence at all, wouldn't be tied or wouldn't have any um, kind of a relation to your perception, your mind, your cognition whatsoever. So it would, it would be a pot, a pot uh, in and of itself, always already, forever and always a pot. It's always, you'd sort of discover it as always having always already been a pot, it, like even the label pot uh, would exist in and of itself as part of its definition. So of course, when you put it that way, almost in a cartoon way, no one would believe such an object exists. But of course, in terms of our ignorance, the way we behave towards things uh, in the world, our, our ignorant conception takes things to be precisely this. So if you're, you, you don't like a particular relative or neighbor, it's that person's a jerk. I know for a fact they're a jerk. It, it doesn't, maybe their mom loves them. You would tell me, well, that's not even, they're a jerk, even if their mom loves them or whatever. It's like, they're always already that nature. They will always be that nature. It has nothing to do with my judgment, the way I'm labeling or perceiving it that way, right? Or like, let's say you're attached to something. It, uh, you know, like a particular form of jewelry or possession that you have, you know, like let's say, you fan, you know, your fancy car or whatever. Um, this has nothing to do, uh, you know, the way I perceive it. I don't want it to, to ever be broken or have scuff or anything. It's kind of like in my mind of considering it uh, to be outside of any kind of relationship to anything else. So even if it gets damaged or scuffed or there's a scratch on it, there's this huge shock. Well, that can't possibly be. How did this happen? This is supposed to be absolutely kind of pure and unchangeable in and of itself. It has nothing to do with how I value it. Whereas, you know, like, let's say a dog comes up and pees on the tire or something like that. It doesn't see it as being the fancy, amazing car. It's just like, it's either that or the fire hydrant, right? So, uh, so we, we know all this one and we, we've sort of studied this enough. We know what sort of the first door uh, is. Everything, uh, existing thing is emptiness. So number two, nothing has characteristics of its own. Nothing becomes pure. So in other words, nothing is inherently pure, impure. Nothing sort of um, has any uh, inherent characteristics or qualities, just for the exact same reason the previous one, number one there, that it's empty. It exists, uh, everything exists in terms of relationships. And so it could, nothing could possibly have characteristics, values, or qualities that again are in, in and of themselves um, 
by nature a certain way outside of relationship to anything else or inherent or sort of from its own side. Um, yeah, so uh, in the big, in the Heart Sutra, what we sort of see when you get the commentaries of this, this number two is in particular to show the emptiness of causes. Causes have their own emptiness. Causes uh, only exist as causes insofar as they determine the causal network to have effects. So a cause can't exist by itself outside of relationship, particularly outside of relationship to having an effect or producing an effect. That's what a cause is. A cause only makes sense as a cause insofar it's relying upon something else, in effect. Okay. So in uh, number three is freedom from wishing. Is the third one, which is results have their own emptiness. Things are cause and result. Uh, so again, you don't, ex uh, yeah. So like this, things are cause and result in ways you don't expect. All depends upon emptiness and karma. So it's the same thing. An effect only makes sense or is uh, in and of itself an effect insofar as it's related to a cause. You don't have causes without effects, you don't have effects without causes. So what's interesting is, of course, um, because our mind's so ignorant and we, we take things to be inherently existing, we precisely, in this case, misunderstand uh, causality or karma itself. We don't see things in terms of relationships. We think things in terms of sort of substances or objects or whatever else or principles in life that are unrelated to anything else. And that's why karma or causality always seems to be sort of a mysterious thing happening to us, sort of victimizing us. It's because we have this false um, understanding of things, false understanding of causality itself. We don't see the emptiness of causality that makes causality what it is, makes it work. And so if that's the case, we don't even observe our own karma, our own sort of what we're producing in the world, what we're putting out, how that ends up creating the world we end up living in. Instead, we end up thinking that everything's being done to us, almost the world's a container that we're like a marble that you drop into and that we're sort of a, a sort of a innocent victim uh, subject to these blind, uh, unknowable uh, processes or causes in our life. Things happen, we don't know why they do. We're just sort of these passive observers or passive victims to things. When really, if you see everything as being cause and effect, everything being uh, causality, everything being holes and parts, in other words, everything being relationships, everything being how we perceive things and how we um, set the world up according to our understandings of things, so according to our perceptions, understanding our cognition of things, then we really, really understand karma and then we start to see our responsibility for things. You know, this is kind of like the existential searching thing of finding our own freedom, finding our own responsibility, that we're the ones creating the world, creating in particular ourselves in the situations we find ourselves in. We're sort of, quote, thrown into situations, but how those situations affect us, what they mean, how they, how they make sense, how they're structured, how they're operating is because of our mind. So if that's the case, uh, there's a little guess you might just, just right out of Diamond Cutter book here. He says, you know, there's three under, ways of understanding our causal relationship to the world. Two kind of bad ones or ones that, you know, aren't correct. And then the final correct one. So the first one was be the cause of your number one, which is, um, this is the idea of like work hard, save money, samsaric worldview. So in, in other words, um, you know, we basically just have to be normal worldly people and just do our best uh, sort of fighting with the world, which is separate from us, um, has sort of nothing to do with us and take what we can from the world, uh, you know, even sort of in a responsible way. But it's the idea, you know, almost like we're sort of put into the world. That's a foreign thing to us. We're sort of a part of it. And as our own agency, which is unrelated to things, somehow we have to do our best to sort of survive or find happiness in the world, create the world as best we can. Uh, the second view is um, uh, half working hard and half giving to others. So it's sort of half worldly, half dharma point of view. So this would be the idea of having your regular ego, I'm just trying to survive, you know, be sort of egotistical, make things work for me in my life. And then half of, uh, you know, I behave half that way and the other half way is I'm being very generous and very spiritual and giving things away and just trying to be as selfless as possible. That's sort of the, that's what most people actually understand by spirituality or karma. Uh, when you look at sort of more, um, 
you know, sort of popular. I don't want to say vulgar because that might have a little bit more of a negative connotation. But just a little bit more, uh, I guess, popular sense, even of karma or Buddhism, it's the idea that, um, you know, Buddhism and understanding karma will help you create a, a happy, worldly life in this one life. All you have is this one life. The point is just to manage it as best you can, um, you know, find some sort of peace and happiness and contentment and inner peace in the moment as you go about your worldly life that helps you be a, a better worldly person and get your worldly so the eight worldly dharmas get your sort of worldly projects in order, your worldly involvements in order, so we get a certain degree of return from them, right? So this is uh, contradicted by the final view, which is more sort of the heart sutra dharma cutter view, which is all sort of successful worldly involvements, all well, just comes from giving or projection of your mind, your generosity. So as we see that basically, rather than seeing everything's coming at you, like you're sort of unrelated to the world you're in it just kind of trying to manage things the best you can or survive it that would be the first sort of worldview second worldview is 50 50. it's kind of like a low jung attitude where it's just like i'm trying to make uh, lemonade out of lemons i'm doing by being a spiritual person most of the time as best i can and at the same time being sort of a savvy survivor in worldly relationships i can sort of find a degree of happiness or, or inner peace when really sort of the final view presented in the Heart Sutra and Diamond Cutter Sutra is the view of karma is that basically everything is a projection of your mind. Everything is your projection. Causally, everything is coming from you as a cause that then ripens as the effect, which the effect being the world that you end up living in. So literally everything is your freedom. Everything is your responsibility. Um, everything in terms of the movie of your life is coming from you, how you're the scriptwriter writing it. Right. So this is the case, uh, only following the path, keeping your vows gives you the, the happiness, the inner peace, uh, the results that you're seeking. So this is sort of the big take, on, um, take home um, lesson here from the Heart Sutra is this, that uh, everything is just a projection. We can't manipulate external factors. Um, but uh, once you sort of get the wisdom here, you'll get everything you want controls what happens to you. I have it sort of as a little note written down here. So, um, it, like your whole life is trying to make things happen and not have them happen and not understand why um, things don't happen the way you want them to. And so you're getting frustrated and crazy. But this is again because we quote unquote get it ass backwards. Again, we're just trying to make things work by actually involving yourself in the externals rather than the internal, seeing that how things actually uh, come from us. And so the key is, is following the Dharma path, keeping our vows and commitments purely, observing our karma, keeping our karma pure, doing our best to really, keeping our karma pure really through good ethics is not just creating virtue or good energy or merit, not just purifying uh, negativities, uh, all the self-cherishing, uh, minds that we have in self-grasping minds that lead to suffering, but moreover serving others, giving to others. Those are sort of the three components of our morality here. So um, I have a little list here, uh, just interesting, is just three different, uh, two different ways of understanding this from the two different schools, either the mind only school or the middle way school, which is interesting. So the mind only school, um, very, very subtly, just like in, you know, in terms of the heart sutra here, uh, they'll claim, of course, that there's no separate reality because everything is the mind. Um, there is, you know, you've got subjects and objects, uh, but within the context of a lay of a jana or storehouse consciousness, which basically means that what you're perceiving on your day to day basis is your own projections, your own conventions, your own labelings of things, and that ultimately their real nature, the absolute nature of reality, is just your mind. So the final foundation of reality is just your perceptions or mind uh, to things. So that's what's really real. Whereas the Magyumikas um, say that everything basically is because it's labeled by the mind, how we think and talk about things, in particular linguistically, conventions of language and grammar, for instance. Um, we project ourselves uh, and the objects or even other people in the world, we're all projection. So even the ego itself or the mind itself, how we take the mind to be is a projection. That's what's interesting. So things exist outside of our mind because mind is projecting the inside and outside, even the concept of inside and outside, even the concept of dualism, so to speak, the sort of duality appears that these things are projections themselves, right? 
So this is why in a lot of ways, as a, from a Buddhist point of view, um, everything is your projection. So you're responsible for everything. This is why we sort of keep our vows and our karma. Is the sentient beings you're trying to saw to sort of save and help make Buddhas have the same status you do. They're projections of your mind. They're labels of your mind. There's basically story constructs, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Um, so just. Uh, yeah, well, I've had this interesting, there's a little note here, when your karma changes or runs out, your perceptions change, this is what rebirth really means. So I've only, this is the thing that Kishan Michaels taught more than once, I think is really good that when we talk about rebirth or quote unquote reincarnation, what we're really talking about are the projections or the perceptions changing. Whether uh, just in your life, you have huge change, like let's say you move, go to a different country, change jobs. You go from a projection like a rebirth. Oh, I got, you know, I was married. I got a divorce, real bad divorce. I started dating. I'm married again. I moved somewhere else. I'm in a whole new world. What happened? That's amazing. It's like I've been quote unquote reborn, or vice versa. Like you know, sort of being reincarnated a negative thing. Oh, I've got cancer. I was a very active person at work. I'm running around exercising now. I'm in a hospital bed and I'm dying of cancer. Uh, it's like a, a different realm, almost like a different bardo. What happened? Different dream. You know, wh where's the old me? Let's say you the chemo works and you get out of it. Two years later, you're jogging and this and that. It's like, wow, I've been reborn again. I almost, I'm a cancer survivor. I almost died. So all these different kind of storyboards in a lot of ways, the way they change, the way the karma is changing, the way it can, the karma can run out or we have new karma ripening. This is the idea that creating new forms of embodiment, new worlds that you end up living in. So literally, it's it's kind of like this is the best way to understand reincarnation. Basically, is the projections of your mind change, and that's why you can reincarnate in something like like a dog or a bug or a hungry ghost or something. There's no soul like a Matthew Richards me that gets kind of shot out of a cannon and, and then lands into a pre-made body where you're your old self or personality trying to work this new body like a puppet. That's how some people take reincarnation. So they always say, you know, how would um, how would that work? If I'm Matthew as a dog, wouldn't I be like, hey, what's going on? I'm a dog. Hey, you know, trying to talk to your old friends as Matthew in the, in, in the Golden Retriever now. Don't you recognize me? Uh, you're a dog. The perceptions, the stories change. The movies change. So now you're in the movie of a dog. The, the labeling has changed. That's a little bit more believable than the idea that there's some kind of immutable, undying self or personality that goes, you know, like leapfrogging body to body to body, you know, sort of like shape shifting, like some kind of um, Hollywood movie or something like that. It's basically just kind of like the movies change, the stories change, the characters change, you know. What's this, what's sort of the basis there is the mind, which itself is changing, right? So again, just to conclude here, um, uh, just on the fourth um, uh, fourth path, which is the path of meditation or embodiment, is this idea that um, it's kind of interesting at this point, the path of meditation, you're getting used to seeing what you saw for the first time in the path of seeing. So again, the rest of your path after you see emptiness directly on the third path, the path of insight or seeing, you're perceiving emptiness directly, is just all your subsequent practice or living with that experience and deepening it, making it more subtle, really embodying it, living it, making it more stable until you get enlightened. And again, this is the big thing is what do you see the third path going on to the fourth path? You see that um, you can't, you're just seeing pieces of things or data or bits or basis of, uh, you know, imputation, basis of your labeling. And then it's your mind or judgment, which is creating the object. So again, this is a similar thing in, in good old modern philosophy is that if I have a um, in a manual can study so threefold to this imagination I can have different perceptions of my iPhone here but what's unifying them together none of these are unified together they don't even look the same right how would I know a separate perceptions that this is connected to that they don't even look the same one doesn't say uh, I'm a part of the other it's your mind making the link and so that's the idea that, you know, some mind creates what's called X or whatever, object X in this case, which is a phone. So it'd be the same thing uh, in phenomenology that Edmund Herschel talks about that things unfold themselves in a series of perspectives. And conscious, he says, the whole thing is conscious is intentional in the sense that it consciousness of something. So once the ofness, it's the logical relation all of these parts have to a whole. 
So these parts all show themselves or are pointing beyond themselves to something bigger than themselves, a whole of the different perceptions, which then become the, the object or the iPhone, where it's kind of like the sums greater than the, than the uh, uh, collection, the whole, what, I can't remember that, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's the expression I'm trying to say, because obviously you get something bigger and better than any specific uh, kind of uh, perspectives. You have the, the whole object. But the point is it's consciousness that's doing that, not the object itself. That how that object, quote unquote, makes sense, shows itself for what it is. You know, my phone is something that the mind's doing to the object. So this is what you see very, very clearly when you come out of the path of seeing and come back into conventional reality on the fourth path or the path of habituation. Uh, you're embodying that. You're starting to see that everything is just your perception. Everything is just your judgments. So why, um, when you think about it, uh, what's the big take home for this or the final take home for, um, yeah, final take home uh, of the Heart Sutra here is that if everything is a perception and we're always talking about uh, cell phones or my cup or a pot or a model or whatever, but if everything is that way, What's the most important thing? Well, if everything is just a label of your mind, perception of the mind, the way you think and talk about things, the way you use concepts and words, then big things in life, the important things, should be exactly the same way. Uh, happiness, um, suffering, death, these are all perceptions too. These are all quote unquote meaning contents and they can be approached in exactly the same way. If I'm creating things just out of judgments, then the same thing, we can apply that to death itself. So when you think about it, the wheel of life where uh, Yama is holding the big mirror and you're seeing your reflection, six realms of samsara, you're seeing your movie, yourself in the mirror, and then Yama, Lord of Death, or the Grim Reapers holding it, kind of like, ha, 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 you know, you're seeing all your, you know, true sufferings, first noble truth, first are your truth, old age, sickness, uh, um, and death, suffering and death. Um, then outside in the corner of the little talker, the picture, you always have Buddha pointing to the moon, the emptiness of the mind, showing you the way out of the prison, sort of the black iron prison as, um, you know, Carl Jung and Philip Dick and all these guys would talk about. Um, so basically, when you think about it, Buddhism by understanding of Genesis karma is really about defeating or erasing those true sufferings, in particular, old age suffering and death. These are perceptions. Now, we're born into these perceptions based on our previous karma, but by changing the karma, we can change the perceptions and eradicate these things and become deathless. So this is what I remember, uh, Geshe Michael said, but other lamas too, that they sort, sort of say that, you know, when we talk about these things, particularly with Tantra, um, we're not being figurative, we're being literal. So we're not just being symbolic in the sense that, oh yeah, you know, becoming deathless or immortal or no death, no suffering. Um, you know, we don't really mean that. It's just, again, helping you live a normal, worldly life where you're nice to your neighbors and kind of a good worker at the factory. And you're able to be in the present moment more and more and be kind of happy. And no matter how bad things happen, you kind of go with the flow. It's actually, you don't sell yourself short on that. It's actually going all the way with it and going to a new form of life, um, a new enlightened form of life or Vajra body, so to speak, where these things no longer exist because those perceptions no longer exist. That's what really means, what we mean about getting over the ignorance and getting to nirvana is how to sort of turn off or disassemble sort of the death machine of samsara. If you remember in the intermediate scope of Lam Rim, samsara is identified at the end of that as being your five aggregates. Samsara is you. It's your embodiment, your body and the world that's logically connected to it. So if we can change our perceptions of ourselves with tantra, perceptions of our mind, the world will follow. So rather than having an organic body of flesh and blood that is born, grows a little while and then starts to fall apart, gets sick and gets old and eventually dies, we can change our perception to a completely pure world and enlightened being or angelic being living within it. That's kind of the real meaning here of uh, the Heart Sutra. It really means about overcoming ignorance, ignorance of this potential that we have, 
uh, we take everything as being the way it, you know, always already the way it should be, but we have a completely, and once we understand emptiness, we have a completely different option here on the table. Uh, our root mind and root prana themselves can transform into a completely different being and completely different world that we'll live in. Uh, our mind and body right now are contaminated, and so you get the logical correlate to that is the, the, the horrible world that we end up living in with all the suffering in it, right? Okay, so um, have yours is interesting. I remember Geshe Michael talking about this in terms of Tantra. Uh, you remember it says, everything works depending on how kind you are to others. So basically with Tantra is about keeping all your body Bodhisattva balance and making Bodhicitta and the six perfections your main practice at each moment. So the three levels of balance when you start to study Tantra, you, you start to understand this in, in that we end up creating this world, uh, this, um, uh, you know, Elysium kind of paradise here in the world just through by keeping our vows properly and understanding how karma works with understanding the Heart Sutra or Diamond Cutter at its deepest level. So I have here, I remember him talking about um, basically um, that your subtle body, your chakras and channels and prana or winds, all of those are geared right now to more worldly contaminated perceptions coming from our self-cherishing mind. And so everything's constricted, but the moment we start to have a more sort of better understanding of emptiness and the wisdom realizing emptiness, bodhicitta, the wish through compassion and love to realize emptiness for the benefit of others, help them realize it too. All of this subtle body, this soul body that we have starts opening up and the prana starts flowing differently. And again, we start to reverse the aging process. We start to reverse um, all this bad karma and eliminate the bad karma and changing our perception. So Tantra is about understanding that whole architecture and using those uh, subtle powers that we have within our nervous system to get these realizations of emptiness and uh, compassion quicker and in a more powerful way. Okay, um, and then it's interesting that once we, at uh, the end of the, I like this, the fourth um, path, we start going into the fifth path, which is no more learning or enlightenment here. So uh, we've turned everything around. We're no longer the victim of our thoughts, um, you know, um, sort of listening to our sort of karmic echo of our own self-cherishing and self-grasp, which leads to sufferings. Uh, you know, there are all these uh, sort of feedback is directed at us by our karma. So we end up changing our karma and uh, keeping our vows and commitments based on our understanding of emptiness. So we get to the point that of quote unquote, no knowledge, the end of the fourth path, where we again have nothing to fear. I like this. This is sort of two practices, Christina. It's kind of like our, our sort of heart practice here. So once you understand your perceptions, once you see that they're yours coming from you, not at you, uh, nothing uh, or nothing can frighten you. Nothing. No, you can no longer be afraid of anything. Once you to be afraid of anything, you know how to get enlightened. You know what everything is. You know that everything is just yourself. Everything is just your mind. Everything's a projection of your mind. So just like Master Glantron, founder of Chit Practice, right here behind me uh, in the 11th century, I always said, there's no demons outside of your own mind. Um, you know, all the Maras, she sort of based her whole Chit Practice by understanding the Prajaparamita uh, Sutra. I think it's the sixth chapter where it's on uh, the one that's on Mars or your own kind of inner demons. What is the inner demon ultimately? But death and your sort of self-grasping, self-cherishing mind with its accompanying delusions that create all that. But the point is that's within you. There's nothing external to fear because there's no such thing as anything external. Internal, external, those that we get rid of that distinction altogether once we understand emptiness. And this is what leads us out of samsara. Okay, so um, yes, once we understand this emptiness, good deeds then become the paramis or perfections. At this point, our karma is accelerated. Well, it start to ripen in this lifetime. This is the fast path uh, that I talked about in Tantra here. What's especially anything that we're doing from an understanding of emptiness ripens karma faster. Just like it says uh, in the uh, course we did Amit, on Abhidharma Kosha is karma that's done toward more powerful objects or with the greater understanding ripens more intensely and more quicker. So that's why we can talk about getting enlightened in one lifetime and through the tantric path is everything we do with tantra, it's just like Zen, everything is about emptiness at every moment. 
everything is empty and we're creating all of our manifesting all of our bodies uh, deeds of body speech and mind with an understanding of emptiness and karma and what are we doing we're keeping our vows and commitments pure. that's our form of embodiment or all the virtuous habits we have by keeping our vows every the sort of the systematized virtuous behavior you know like aristotle says ethics is just uh good habits so it's the same thing here and because what we're doing from understanding of emptiness everything ripens more powerfully and more quicker which is why we talk about um you know, Tantra being the, the Dorje or Vajra here, which is the thunderbolt. Uh, it's this supposed to be like sort of a magical weapon from Indra. You know, it's kind of like the, the, the atomic bomb or something. But it's the idea that the Vajra path of Tantra, which is that's representing the diamond path or diamond of emptiness, it's also like quick as lightning and as powerful as a thunderbolt. Why? Because everything is done with an understanding of emptiness. Everything is done from the standpoint of each moment where we act, the view of emptiness and Karma, the two truths, the unity of the two truths is what motivates us. So that's the path of no more learning. So uh, once we get to nothing more to learn, that's basically it. This is what we could call, quote unquote, the story. So this is when I uh, was studying Hegel's logic in grad school a million years ago. Uh, my Hegel uh, scholar professor, scholar friends, there's about three of them, um, they always called it once you understand. I'm not going to get into it because we're not talking about Hegel's logic. But what they always said is that basically once you understand Hegel's whole system is an understanding of how conceptuality founds itself or how language speaks itself, that language or the mind creates the world uh, as, a sport, as a form of self-reading. So that's kind of the story. So the whole point uh, they always say is once you know that, you see that in everything. It's basically like seeing emptiness in everything. It's kind of interesting. And so they always said, every being, every human being is trying to get recognized as a creator of their own world, right? As this process of language speaking itself. So they always call that the story, right? It's the only, that's the only story there is. It's the only story worth knowing. And so like Hegel's whole point is that ethically, once you know that, you will let everyone be themselves. You will respect everyone as a center of authority or center of their own universe and see that we're all equal that way, recognizing one another as being human and forgiving one another, loving, forgiving one another, right? Pretty cool. But anyway, uh, that's the story. So what more is there that? So the whole point is science, uh, the science of logic, Hegel's logic is just proving that. So all we, they'd always, well, there's the story. You see, you know, Disney movie, there's the story. There's like anything that's, trying to get at even bits of this or clues of this is just the story. So the story here for the Heart Sutra is the unity of the two truths of emptiness and karma and how that um, in a diluted way creates the hell we live in or with a, uh, in other words, out of ignorance or through wisdom, when we understand how it works, it creates a paradise or heaven, right? They're all just products of the mind. Again, that's the story. That's the story of the Heart Sutra. Um gare gare pere gare pare sam gare bodhi soha. That's all you need to know. That's the only thing you do need to know. That's the story. So I like this at the end. Um, just uh, Buddha says, if you remember, he says, well spoken to, to Avalokiteshvara. He used to, he, the whole students are there, Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara, Chenrezig. And it's basically, he says, you know, you just gave a teaching on this you know, on emptiness and, and karma here, well-spoken, you got it, you got it, you, you, you know, you're number one, you got it. So it's like the three goods, the three yes, 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 which is you got it, I'm happy you spoke accurately, and this is a seal approval, this is my word. Everyone's here is witness that I'm telling you this guy's got it. He got, he got the story. So may we all get the story, which is uh, the story of our own enlightenment. So we'll all get enlightened at a different time in a different way, but the point is it will be in exactly the same way because it is the story. How the story cashes out, for, it will be almost in a Jungian way, completely different for each one of us. But the point is the logical structure of the story is exactly the same. It's just emptiness and karma and taming and recognizing the emptiness of your own mind. There you go. So let's have that as the, the little uh, Christmas and New Year's and Happy Holiday, Hanukkah, every, all the other sort of wonderful seasonal uh, holidays and greetings, wishes here, good energy for the new year. And we can just dedicate this by the blessings of all holy beings, the truth of karma, the power of pure spirit intention, of bodhicitta, 
May all of our Dharma wishes be fulfilled. Okay, lots of love, and we'll see you next time.